The Fairbank Cocktail. Interesting drink dating prior to 1920. That's a nice little twist on the martini. Welcome to the Cocktail Spirit from Small Screen Network. I'm your host, Robert Hess. Now, the Fairbank Cocktail. Um, we don't know exactly why it's called the Fairbank Cocktail. It's almost certainly not from Fairbank, Alaska. Um, Instead, some people say it was named after Douglas Fairbanks Sr. But if it was named after Douglas Fairbanks Sr., why is it not called the Fairbanks Cocktail rather than the Fairbank Cocktail? Uh, Ted Hay in Vintage Spirits and Forgotten Cocktails, where I first came across the drink, uh, says other people also think it was named after uh, this other guy, Fairbank, who was Theodore Roosevelt's vice president. Um, one of the problems I have with that is that Teddy Roosevelt was well known for being anti-drinking, and so for his vice president to have a drink named after him, I don't know, maybe that's a bit of comedy going on? I don't know. But let's take a look at the Fairbank cocktail. We're going to start off with one and a half ounces of gin. Next, we add one half ounce dry vermouth. As you often see me using, I'm, I'm using a small bottle of vermouth. That way I'm taking using it up before the vermouth has a chance to go bad. And I'm keeping my vermouth in the chiller uh, so that it also prevents it from going bad too quickly. One thing you might want to try sometime is um, get a bottle of vermouth, um, maybe keep it out on the shelf. And as you're getting close to the bottom of it, buy a second bottle of the exact same brand, nice and fresh, and taste the two side by side. Uh, both by themselves as well as in a cocktail, whatever cocktail you like the most, it has dry vermouth in it, and just see what difference sort of makes. I suspect you'll start making sure you put your vermouth in the refrigerator after that. Next, we're gonna add two dashes of creme de noix. Now, creme de noix is basically made out of, made of almonds, uh, but it's a sweet liqueur. It adds that kind of a nice nutty flavor uh, to a drink. Um, uh, again, adding two dashes from a, a bottle can be rather difficult. If you've only got a couple of recipes you're doing in your bar at home that use dashes like that, you might want to put it in a small dasher bottle or something. Another thing I sometimes do is hold my thumb over top of the lid and just pour as little as I possibly can into it. Or like you saw me do here, I can just use a spoon as kind of a temporary guide. And if I pour too much, I can control a little bit better than just pouring it straight into the drink. And then we're going to add two dashes of orange bitters. I'm using uh, the Bitter Truth orange bitters. It's wonderful to see all these great bitters are coming to market, and the Bitter Truth people have put a nice set of bitters uh, that can address all your needs, whether it's orange bitters, ar aromatic bitters, celery bitters, even Jerry Thomas uh, bitters. Um, these bitters can add different flavor complexities to a drink. And so quite often, if you see one particular bitter is specified for a, a particular recipe, you might want to try different bitters, just kind of see how that changes things up. You'd be surprised sometimes how much difference you can get just on the different types of bitters. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But orange bitters is really good for gin drinks, and so quite often you'll see me use orange bitters in a gin, gin drink. So two dashes. And again, since we're all using clear ingredients, we're going to take and stir this drink up. Now, as far as I know, the first time this drink appeared in print was in the ABC of Mixing Cocktails. It's a, it's a relatively small, nice little pocket kind of book. Oh, no pockets here. I can put it in. A nice little small pocket book. It's got little tabs on the outside of the pages, like those old dictionaries would have, so it's easy to take a look things up alphabetically. Um, it comes around the 1920s, uh, written by Harry McElhoney. Um, who was very famous for Harry's New York bar in Paris, as well as a bunch of other bars, and a lot of great drinks come out of this book. And so if you can find a copy of it, I highly recommend it. Comes out nice and clear. It's got a bit of a tinge of color to it. That color is coming from the Cream de Noir. Got kind of a reddish hue to it. We're going to add a cherry. Um, I'm going to be using what I would refer to as a maraschino cherry because it's more of the modern day artificial rather than a maraschino cherry. Um, I think visually that kind of adds a nice little jewel to it. Plus in, in Ted's book, the picture he had also was using a maraschino cherry. Um, 
nice, nice, beautiful. I think the color comes through really nicely. Um, not normally the type of cherry you might use in a drink. But feel free to use a maraschino cherry if you want to instead. Let's see how it tastes. I mean, it, it, it's definitely a martini. Um, if you think about it, we're using gin, dry vermouth, and orange bitters. You know, that is a martini through and through. Um, even the ratios are very close to a standard martini. We're just adding a couple dashes of the Cremant Noir, which don't really overpower the drink at all. They're basically just kind of this little teeny hint in the background. You might even serve this drink to a person expecting a regular martini, and it might taste to them just like a regular martini. The pink color um, is going to take and be a little bit different, as well as the cherry instead. But I still think this is a great drink for any martini drinker out there. And so there we have the Fairbank cocktail.